Welcome to this episode of Beers and Bites. This evening, we have yet another special guest with us, Tim Panagas. He is the CTO of MicroShare. And trust me, we're gonna have a very interesting discussion this evening. Today, we have our co-hosts, Chris Jordan of Fluency Security and Jeremy Murdershaw of Fortify 24 by 7. Gentlemen, get ready to show your beers. Chris, lead us off, please. All right, I, I went hunting, I found this one from Aslan Beers, Baby Shark, for all you national fans out there that had to deal with that song two years ago, or three years ago. Um, I, I, I'm lightweight this time, Jeremy, both 5.5s. The other one, I'm gonna start with this one only to see if I can handle it. It's as retro as you can get, the Virginia Beer Company, Liquid Escape, and this one is a, a tart ale. I'm not normally a tart or a sour kind of guy when it comes to beers. A lemongrass and sea salt. Hence why the other one's so big. We're going to try it out though, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds horrible. Lemongrass and sea salt in the beer? This isn't a spa. It could look like chocolate. <laughs> All right, Jeremy, what do you got tonight? Close. So I'm going to, I'm going to try a, an experiment. Uh, Stone, one of my favorite breweries here in, in uh, Southern California, makes these uh, you know, festival beers and things like that. And this one was for the new year, right? So here we are six months later. Will it be as delicious as it was on New Year's Eve or will it be skunky? We'll find out. <laughs> Second one, in my uh, traditional fashion, I'm looking for that low calorie option. Um, for those of you who like to drink but don't like to get fat, um, this is 105 calories. It's a hazy India IPA, four uh, percent. Not a lot of not a lot of alcohol, but actually is really delicious. So it's called Hazy Pup from Golden Road Brewing. All right, and Tim, what do you have this evening, sir? Well, I hope it's not uh, too much of faux pas, but I'm uh, gluten free. Uh, unfortunately, so I had I like to indulge in some uh, craft ciders. So this is ah. slow down from a uh, northeastern um, cidery called Artifact, and it's a it's a basically a bubbly uh, apple cider, almost uh, uh, vinegar, almost. It's a uh, very oh, wow. dry, acidic, um, but it is filtered. So uh, my favorite ciders are sort of. Uh, the UK style where it's, you know, some guys found the rotten apples under the tree, stuck them in a barrel and decided <laughs> to tap it, right? So uh, they don't really do that super thick stuff in the US much, but um, this is this comes as close as I could find locally. Yeah, we had one guest on here one time who literally said, if I can't get a fork to stand up in my beer or my ale, it's not drinkable. <laughs> Well, this evening, I think my wife did all right. We've got a product called Sweetwater. Uh, it is a hazy ale based uh, from a company out of Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia is where the brewery's at. And it's at 6.2%. So uh, you know, if I make it through this can, then I do have my Alaskan IPA backups that I will have available as well. <laughs> but with that, so, so Tim, listen, it sounds like you've had quite uh, an amazing background uh, as we you know, did a little bit of research here, but I am definitely intrigued when I hear these words about infection control, predictive cleaning, <laughs> occupancy and asset zoning, right? Smart buildings without sacrificing privacy. I think that's a heck of a lead off. So please take a moment, tell us about your background and, and how we get to these words that uh, we just brought up here. Yeah, so it's a, it's a long road. Um, I guess I, um, you know, I've always been a data guy. Uh, I started out out of school, decided I wanted to get involved with artificial intelligence and um, went out into the working world and found that artificial intelligence didn't really mean what I thought it was going to mean, having read, you know, uh, Gibson, Stevenson, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, reality met, uh, met pretty hard my, my fantasies, but um, got out of school and found one of the only games in town in the early 90s were people doing expert systems. That was the uh, AI of the time. And um, you know, it was really applied for banking software for the most part. You know, that was really what people were doing with this stuff. So I kind of got involved 
in applying AI and data science to banking problems early on, financial services problems being very much about data, um, early adopters of that kind of technology. And kind of my uh, career evolved from there. Um, and um, as we got into the newer generations of AI, um, obviously now machine learning is the king of AI, um, looking at how you know, data can be brought together to do interesting analytics. And um, you know, my last step, I was still kind of writing bank software, insurance, you know, healthcare, you know, big enterprise kind of um, systems. And I really said, you know, there's got to be a way to democratize these technologies because uh, my last stop was a startup that we sold to Accenture. And I was um, uh, in charge of one of their global practices while I was with them and uh, got to see how people are applying these tools and technologies across the world. Really big projects, you know, 50 million, $100 million projects um, doing really interesting stuff. But you began to see that they were doing the same things again and again, spending a lot of money to do them, uh, taking on these big uh, risky projects that were prone to failure because of Sony moving parts. And as you saw them again and again, you said, you know, there's these common concepts. We really ought to be able to boil them down, bolt them together and really drive it down market because I think all businesses can benefit by being more data-driven. If you can figure out how to de-risk it and help bring people up the, up the learning curve quickly. Um, so that really is the mission that um, caused me and my co-founders to start MicroShare. I'm now about almost nine years ago, eight, eight, eight plus years ago. And um, I would like to say the rest is history, but we're still very much in the thick of it, um, building it as we go. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I know having worked at IBM back in the day, they, you know, they were all about smart cities and smart this and smart that. Yeah. And I know you guys have picked up on that for smart buildings. And you've got these intelligent IoT type of sensors and stuff like that. So talk a little bit about that, if you would, please. Yeah. So, you know, we started out really with this idea that we're going to do data management and really with an eye towards knowing that we want to collect really high quality data and we want to do it in a way that naturally feeds into what we know people are going to want to do in AI. So, you know, the normal scenario with data science is I'm just going to get all this junk that's out there, you know, digital exhaust, log files and random transaction stuff. And then you have massive data engineering job to get it all into a format where you can even feed it in to see if there's anything of interest in it. Um, a big journey to get you know, to the point where you're actually looking at any data to know if there's any value. So we said, ah, that's probably the wrong way to do it. What if we engineered this from the start to, to generate good, high quality data? Um, you mentioned privacy, you know, there's a few extra hooks in there I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then, you know, we had this data management tool that we had built and we sort of said, hey, who will let us uh, manage their data, right? So <laughs> we couldn't go to uh, IT at a bank and say, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna take over your CRM system, or we want to manage your, you know, your your account balances." And you know, it's we we couldn't tap into the holy of holies. Nobody's gonna do something radically different with that. And it occurred to us ultimately that IoT was a brand new set of data. IT didn't really know what to do with this. Um, the business is interested in it, but it doesn't really have this well-established home or pattern. So we could come in with a radical way of thinking about how to do the data management. And it was, you know, kind of under the covers of this already radical idea about collecting, you know, IoT data. So, you know, that's, I think, really where we ended up. And then in IoT, obviously, it's a big umbrella. Um, we sort of looked around and we played in a bunch of different um, industries because we built a fairly decently horizontal platform for this, but where you really look at what people are doing, real solving real problems um, and are underserved by current IT tech, way underserved by analytics. Um, we started to see, you know, ultimately smart cities are cool, but smart cities are made up of smaller units and the smaller units are typically buildings. Um, so we found a home really there in helping people understand complex physical spaces so in the in the real estate world, they're called built spaces generically, and you might that might call to mind office space. You know, we uh, not the movie, but the uh, the thing. Um, we're a little bit like both the movie and the thing. Uh, we definitely have some office buildings in our portfolio, but we've sort of 
specialized in, in otter uh, kind of uh, non-traditional perhaps, um, you know, so hospitals and airports and manufacturing facilities and college campuses and tend to be very uh, complex, usually sprawling kind of facilities, which really are beyond the means of the guy who might walk around a building, you know, can get a grasp of something that's, you know, 10,000 square feet to 50,000 square feet. A, a guy can understand what's going on in that building, but once you've got, you know, a half a square mile of building spread out, you've got, you know, 100,000 square feet, you can't do that with your eyes and your feet anymore. And um, so that really is the, I think, core problem that we've really latched onto. What do these guys need to know in terms of telematics, bringing data about that, you know, distributed, large, complex um, built spaces together? And then how do we distill it so that we're not just washing massive amounts of data about a large place? How do we distill that information using AI tools to help make a better, make better decision making? So then you, you take the output then of that data to use to manage filtration systems, airflows, um, heating, cooling elements, and all these other components. Yeah, and you know, we have found, I think, a niche as well, Al, in um, the non-smart building space. Um, if you're building a building today, particularly building a you know, high-end office building, you're going to put in a lot of um, smart infrastructure into, you know, the, the typically it's the stuff that's inside the walls, right? <laughs> inside the basement, your HVAC, your plumbing, all of this is retrofit with pretty smart systems, complex systems. Um, but if you've got a new building, you've got maybe an SI challenge and maybe you need to struggle to understand the data, but your building pretty much comes out day one smart. When I talk about things like college campuses or, um, you know, hospitals, we're doing a lot of hospitals in the UK, for instance, a lot of these buildings have been around for 500 years. You know, they're giant, thick stone walled buildings. Nobody's putting smarts inside the walls. So what we have found ultimately is making the dumb building smart is a good niche uh, for us. So we tend to use, um, I call them lick and stick. My marketing guys hate when I say that, but you know, Simple to deploy wireless battery operated sensors where you can literally peel off and stick this up and um, collect data immediately and, and for three to five years based on the battery life. Um, so that you don't need to like do this massive retrofit of all your infrastructure in order to benefit from all that data. Um, and then what we also find is in a mix like a college campus, you might have some brand new buildings, you might have some really old buildings. And we'll put these up in brand new buildings as well, because one of the key things about a campus is understanding the buildings relative to each other. So the, the kind of data, the uh, resolution of that data, if you will, it's a lot easier to, to process it if it all comes from a common infrastructure. So we've kind of focused over time really on this, you know, easier to deploy, um, simple battery operated um, sensing equipment. So one final question, and I'm going to let the guys jump in here. But uh, do you see applications uh, for use cases with today's challenges with the airlines and the cruise industry, for example, where they're trying to maintain this infectious control yeah, yeah. Um, and their contained spaces, right? So yeah. talk a little bit about that use case. Yeah, so, you know, um, in 2019, we thought our killer app was going to be um, indoor asset tracking. You know, we had uh, a lot of companies who had, you know, things like wheelchairs in a hospital setting or luggage carts in a airport where, you know, they were expensive pieces of equipment. They tended to drift and the problem was solved by having people walk around continuously looking to police up where their equipment was. Um, so we had to develop sort of a Bluetooth uh, capability for tracking these kind of assets. So you can kind of knew, um, at least in an area where your assets might be, whether the wheelchairs or crash carts or, you know, medicine. Um, but as we went into uh, quarantine, really surprising, um, a lot of this sort of um, normal space stuff dried up. And what we found ourselves doing is all of a sudden pivoting into contact tracing. Um, and, um, 
you know, we adapted all of the technology that we'd already been working on for asset zoning or asset tracking um, to become a contact tracing solution. And um, we did, we've done really amazing amounts of stuff in that last year and a half. Um, really kind of interesting to be right in the middle of that stuff. Um, kind of strangely found ourselves to be one of the global market leaders in private um, contact tracing. So we didn't work for any governments. We're not in any you know, large jurisdictions, but if you uh, want to work in a, in a mine or you want to go to you know, a meatpacking plant, you know, these guys are essential workers and they couldn't work from home. They're very physically oriented. Um, you could, the employers could put these solutions in and then uh, really help people. Really, I, I probably contact tracing has been talked about in, a lot now, but it's really as a, an aid to people's memory. Um, when you know somebody gets sick and they come and say, well, who did you have contact with? Well, I remember the five guys I had lunch with. I don't remember who, was, who, I, who I had my back to at the table next to me. And that's where you know the digital um, solutions come in. And as that evolved, um, what we began to see is the synergies between more classic kind of um, IoT technologies for spaces and the contact tracing. So the killer app, I think, ultimately is air quality plus occupancy. So we can do scoring of a conference room, let's say, or a break room uh, in a manufacturing plant, and I can tell that let's say there were 10 people just got off shift and they ate their lunch in the break room and they left 10 minutes ago and I come in, contact tracing doesn't know that uh, they were there because we were separated by time. So none of our bracelets detected each other, none of our cell phones detected each other. But here I am 10 minutes later, breathing the same air that 10 people were just breathing. So what really matters is, am I really breathing the same air or is that air being turned over in that room? and at what rate, right? So you can do a scoring of the occupancy profile for a space based on the air turnover using simple air quality sensors that you can, you can place up and generate sort of safety scores for a given room at any given point in time. So you could say, hey, should I sit down here to have lunch? Look at my app. Oh yeah, I'm in the green, I, could, I you know, should be good. Either nobody's been there or the air is turning over really well, or, oh, geez, uh, it looks red. Maybe I should, you know, go eat in my car or whatever. Um, so those kind of tools that have begun to kind of pop out, those are what's, I think, really exciting now is um, seeing how those are, are um, being pushed out. And we're using them in hospitals and nursing homes and um, factories. Um, and as people, I think, get back to work this year, you know, the white collar people returning from working from home, I think we're going to see, um, I think we're going to see a little bit of nerves. Um, I, sure. I, for one, am not in a huge hurry to go back to an office. Um, but um, I think we're going to see that employees will want to see these same kinds of data uh, in place so that they can feel good about it. Um, and of course, the caveat to all that, which has been really big in the news, contact tracing and privacy. So you better make sure that you've got a good answer to how are you, how am I sure you're not misusing uh, the data about where I am, who I'm talking to, and you know what I might be doing on my off hours, right? So that's the, uh, that's the key, I think. All right, Chris, Jeremy. So, you know, Tim, as you, as you look through and you, you talk about it, I mean, this is a huge infrastructure and you brought up AI and stuff. And, and what my mind is, I'm thinking big data and data lakes the amount of data you're probably collecting. Um, can you walk us through like in general designs in my head, when I think of big data, I think you have the collection issue. And then as soon as you're done collecting, you have what's called the normalization issue. Then you, you have your original static model generation and now you have your active model. And then finally, you know, your, your, your anomalies, right? Which yeah. you eventually have to either build a model that says this is the anomaly I'm looking for or you might say, and I'm not a big believer in magic, supervised, unsupervised, oh, I figured out something's wrong. Um, so, so walk us through what, I mean, how did you approach such a massive problem, right? To adjust your solution, approach it. Where did you find the bottlenecks early on? And then like, where did you really, when did you realize the value you had and how did you tune the system? So the first part is really, you know, how did you build this, this Big data systems aren't easy to build. It takes years yeah. uh, when you're a small group. 
So how did you build it? And where, you know, what walk me through how you see the breakdown? Yeah. So Chris, indeed it has taken years. So and, and we're not done, right? So it's a it's a, the ongoing battle. So um, you're quite right about that. I think what we maybe got lucky on um, is my vision going into this was that we would be a streaming data from day one um, solution. So rather than, you know, like a Hadoop model mm -hmm. with big data where it's all about, you know, parking data at rest and um, doing a large scale um, data crunching, we thought of the problem as, you know, what can we do as data is flying through the channel and operate on it in flight so that we, do we have data at rest? Yeah, of course we do. And do we do some historical analysis? Yes. But what we wanted to do is really optimize for that kind of approach where, you know, the data is just constantly streaming at you, um, which gives you the opportunity to do things like complex event processing. Um, so rather than looking as a report, what happened, what's happening right now, and what should I do about it? So it's really that insight into action loop that we were trying to close. And I think probably you can see maybe a mix in the portfolio of stuff that we offer today. Contact tracing is usually stuff that happens two weeks later. So it's a little bit of a retrospective, but things like office controls are, are real time. Things like, you know, determining whether you should go have lunch in this break room or not is real time. You don't want to know, should I have lunch? You want, uh, should I have had lunch? You want to know, should I have lunch now? Right? I just make a mistake? Yeah, so really, you know, what you're hitting is something that we talk about in our company all the time. We call it data rivers, right? Yeah. So instead of a data lake where you're making decisions historically, data rivers, you're making decisions on the actual stream of data. And, and then normally in that situation, you're, you're using the data lake to generate the models and to validate the models. Then the yeah. models go to place in the river and then you test them out. That's right. So, yeah. That's so right. first of all, there's not many people doing data river type of work, right? I mean, to tell you the truth, the whole industry is about static lakes and separating the lakes and then we're going to yeah. do the books and freeze the books. So, you, so you're right. So how did you, I mean, that's interesting. How did you wind up dealing with that problem? Did you get somebody smart? Are you the smart guy? What would happen? No, I, I don't claim uh, <laughs> a couple more beers. Uh, I'll tell you just how <laughs> stupid I am. But, um, you know, uh, I think I think um, kind of got lucky on this. I think I'll claim luck. Because um, if I take the, the um, if I take the credit, then I have to take the blame. So, uh, you know, I'm going to hedge my bet there. But um, we, we found sort of when we got into this eight years ago, like I said, we'd been, I'd been doing a bunch of these large scale architecture projects. Um, and um, as I got into scaling it down and when we really sat down to get, get to it uh, eight years ago, um, I seemed like, oh, well, there's all these open source tools we can start to use. And the journey was basically finding that none of them fit our use case as we got into them. You know, they were all a mismatch for how we wanted to do them. Even those that seemed to be uh, uh, data river oriented at their core, you know, exposed that they weren't quite um, designed for it. So what we found a lot is how do we string together tools, um, integrate them well, and then, you know, hammer out that glue code that makes the difference in kind of truing things up. And over time, over, over the years, I think the industry has come a little closer. Um, I think streaming data is now a thing. You'll even see IoT uh, design systems that are you know, coming out of the box uh, for that use case specifically. So that's also part of our challenge is, all right, so things that we may have compromised on eight years ago, you know, three years later, four years later, five years, eight years, which of those things are now candidates to swap out? So the big challenge for me was what's an architecture that'll get us there today, knowing there's compromises, that allows us to swap out where uh, we no longer have to make those compromises without really um, compromising the architecture over time. That's been, I think, the big challenge. You know, the analogy we often use, it's one around, right? We're rebuilding the airplane as we're flying, right? right. Uh, so it's a continual process. So we started with some fundamental tools like, um, you know, Apache Kafka has been, you know, kind of the backbone of a lot of what we've done you know, we started out tentatively. We we're using it a lot more uh, as I look at it today. Um, you know, we're 
um, adapting a lot of, we're, we're a Scala shop. So I don't know if you're familiar with Scala and oh, yeah. actor, actor-based systems. Um, so we use a big cloud of actor microservices to do this processing. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of hard knocks along the way. Um, how to scale it, um, stability, uh, observability, you know, particularly for some of these cutting edge tools, you know, a lot of those things are, are second thought. Right, so uh, you'll, you'll often have to kind of bake in your own hooks and sometimes just uh, close your eyes and hope for the best um, in the early days. So it's been um, knocking a bit about, but I, I think we're in a pretty good place. You know, we've learned a lot about the tools. They've they've improved over time and um, I'm pretty happy with where it's at right now. So the, cu the customer, of course, you brought up really hard stuff to do. Like I, I'm Scala, my son is actually doing some Scala work right now. And, and, and you don't see it often, um so so obviously you don't sit down with a customer and talk this way so so you gotta i don't say you dumb it down you're gonna change the perspective to a customer right so so you do all this process and what was the perspective that was like the aha moment where the guy has got it and said i get this model i understand what's going on yeah you, you talked about the contact tracing but obviously that wasn't your first idea yeah no how did you when did you learn how to pitch your company to express this complex idea that we're going to analyze all this data and not have to explain to them how you're doing it. I mean, how yeah, did you, well, where's that big I hope, I hope the when will be this year coming, Chris. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, that uh, hope springs eternal about really nailing that down. Um, but, 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 but kidding aside, I think, you know, for our customers, um, not just in the real estate industry, I don't think anybody is really um, ready to be data driven, right? It's very rare, I think, to find people who just get it. Right. And um, so I think a big part of what we're up to is trying to make the concept simpler, deliver value early, and then give people a journey that they can sort of progress through it. Uh, because when they start, they don't get it, they don't trust it. Um, and so you have to give them a series of aha moments um, throughout the adoption curve. Um, keep showing value, keep showing them they can be a hero in their organizations using the data to drive it. That um, it's not there to make them feel stupid. It's not there to displace them. It's there to support their decision making, support the way that they go about operations. So that's kind of the, the overarching way about it. One of the sort of most mature things that we did was really predictive cleaning. So you want to talk about a, a problem that's not IT driven at all. It's, yeah. you know, how does your how does your bathroom get cleaned? And, um, you know, uh, we started that, you know, probably about six years ago and um, get, got even more important over quarantine, right? The, yeah. uh, specifically earlier on when uh, services were thought to be a risk, um, everybody was being asked to do more with less. Um, staff were not reporting, staff were getting sick. Um, you know, people were like, why should I come to work? I don't want this risk. I'm, I'm just cleaning bathrooms. I don't want that. Mm -hmm. So there was a real, real struggle. And ultimately what we were able to do was by combining that occupancy data with um, uh, indicators that, that drive whether a place would really need to be cleaned or um, including human feedback. So we deploy a lot of these You've probably seen them in, in airports and such oh, yeah. push button type devices like this. Um, combining that data together, we can give an operations manager the ability to change the cleaning routes so that they all of a sudden can see in their complex environments, what are the places that need cleaning most and when? Um, you'll see these patterns jump out. You know, there's a people use this bathroom in the morning and there's a locker room in the basement where people, you know, uh, take showers after they go to gym at lunchtime and the, the oh, patterns so, unfold. So it's really like uh, maybe a truck logistics routing, right? For UPS or, or FedEx or something, right? Where's, where do I got to go today? I think that's right, Al. It's, it's, it's exactly right. Except, you know, it's not packages. It's, it's the guy with the, with the soap and the paper towels <laughs> um, because those are the things that run out, you know, uh, across. And so now, that, that's just a nitty gritty um, value we can deliver to an organization. And we've crunched a massive amount of data to make it fairly simple to see, you know, what are the scores of these spaces? 
how well do you do historically? And then you can redesign um, the way that you direct your cleaning staff. And then on top of that, if you guys want, we can also do manage the exceptions for you. Like, oh, for some reason there was a big meeting over here and you'd normally get to this at three o'clock, but it needs to be cleaned now. So do you send some just in time to, uh, to do that? And it has a big impact on uh, tenant satisfaction. Saves money, tenants more satisfied, I mean, that's a pretty easy equation. And then we get people who want more, right? It's a, it's not glamorous, but um, it solves a real world problem. And then people are like, well, gee, that was, that was great. What so else? You, you, got, you got me curious early on when you started saying privacy, right? And then you started talking the UK and I'm going to jump to Europe, of course, with yeah. GDPR. And here you are maybe putting sensors on people or using your Bluetooth, tracking them on well, their how phone. Do you, how do you track somebody in the bathroom, like at the airports? So like you're, you're talking, is it motion detectors? What are you doing? What is the Typically, device yeah. that actually tracks? Let's get to yep. that. So we've got um, two strategies usually. Um, one is door open and close. Mm -hmm. So you can just you know make good guesses based on how many times that's happening. Or we use PIR uh, motion detectors, right? Okay. And, um, so it's not really a people counter, it's more a, an activity counter. Um, and what you find is that's, that's adequate, more than adequate to, to know when you need to. Right, but when you get into the contract, tra the contact tracing piece of it, right? And you're now talking Europe yeah. and the right to be yeah. forgotten and, and, and yeah. you've got massive amounts of data in these lakes, right? And what if somebody wants to be forgotten? How do you, ha how do you yeah. handle that? Well, I think it's- yeah. Two things to, to Al's point. The first one is you everybody missed an opportunity for a poop joke and you all should be ashamed. Okay. P I R stands for what? Poop something? No. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Sure. Yeah. But but to Al's point, what P I I are you collecting about people with this with these sensors? Yeah. So at the end of the day, there's really no PII, um, no PHI, no PII. Um, we don't know who you are. Um, even when we do contact tracing, we basically assign um, random IDs to the badges. And really the way we're handling that is um, the on-premise um, IT systems will generally have the linkage between the human and the badges, and we'll do that in reverse. So when there's an event, they will look up for this human who their badge is, and then backtrack that way. So none of the data at rest actually has any um, identifiable information. Um, although, you know, anybody who knows enough about AI knows you could, you can make inferences with enough data, right? So, so there is that. But the baseline of our system, you know, one of those kind of crazy ideas that I had early on was that we wanted to build the system so that it had a radical uh, view, I think, um, of ownership of data. Because I think we're, most systems and, and all of the IT systems I tried to adopt, Chris, by the way, you know, mm -hmm. are, are baked with this premise that if I own the database, I must own the data. And then you get these regulatory um, bodies that say, well, actually, no, guys, just because you thought that technically, um, legally, it's not, not the case. And that's where the tension comes in. It's this, um, this mismatch between I own the database, so therefore I can presume to own the data, and, and the world's real understanding now of what that data means. So what we built right from the start was this idea that every row in your database uh, can have more than one owner simultaneously. And we track that and make decisions using a, um, an expert system in real time about what the policies of those multiple owners are relative to the data use, which is really what GDPR is all about, right? It's, it's I want to give permission based on intent of the user. Uh, but of course, in the sort of blunt instrument world that can only be enforced at the highest level, right? Really course intense and data as a, as a massive piece, but that's why we're called micro share is the idea is we ought to be able to make really fine grained decisions almost at the column level, but certainly at the row level to say, I'll share this in this case with you and not this piece with you in that case. And 
have a system that makes those decisions as the data is streaming um, in real time. That's the sort of underlying uh, challenge, the hidden gem, I guess. So things like right to be forgotten actually aren't that challenging because I know at the row level who owns all the data um, and it's a nested ownership relationship. So to the extent that I know that it's you, Al, I can, I can give you a log into the system. You can sign in and it will show you all the data that you own and it'll be all the data from all the places. Um, and um, it's really quite easy to kind of see uh, the totality of what's going on. And I can show you the, the real time stream of everywhere that's being used, who they're using it for, what the endpoints are, what the what the you know the streaming intent is, and then you've got knobs and dials to change what you want to make decisions about there. And I think that, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, but is that really driving the company? And I say that because the value you're bringing to the business is analytics, right? right. And and we had a wonderful situation here down in the south with with the Colonial Pipeline. And, and the thing is, the question is, is did, you're not buying the gas because it has the most secure infrastructure. You're buying the gas because it's the cheapest gas. Sure. And the company that's buying your stuff, they, they want to make sure that they have the right shifts and you know they, this is clean or you know use product air quality and all that stuff. They're focused yeah. on that. They really don't care when it, when it, if it ever gets not a bit of proposal. Do you do you really think that the the understanding of privacy is really going to drive? the final decision for the purchaser? No, um, I don't. And, um, you know, but um, do, hope does spring eternal still. <laughs> it's been one of those things where, you know, these big companies, these big projects that I was doing really did have an appreciation for data governance because they were early adopters, because they're dealing at scale. Um, they really did have uh, an awareness of all of the thorny issues. As you drive down market, um, the awareness of governance goes away. In fact, you know most of them don't even want to don't even want to think about it. It's sort of out of sight, out of mind, right? Um, what I've done is built it with the idea that yeah, you're not going to buy my product because of the privacy, or not buy it because of the privacy. But what I want to have is the engine underneath ready when it becomes relevant, because I believe it will be, but I, that's, I could be wrong. Yeah, no, I'm saying, I, I completely feel for you. I mean, we did the same thing. We went through cinematization, all these things, and yeah. we, we publicize it. Al can tell you, he's probably knows the word cinematization better than anybody else. Nobody ever buys from us, yeah. ever, right? Yeah. And, and we really still do exactly what you do is implement this stuff. And, and I feel that this is a, kind of an awkward thing, but the reality is maybe it made us better because we engineered everything else to handle that. And maybe that made us a better product in the long run. But, um, you know, I'm fascinated. And the other one is, is because you go down this road and, and I don't mean to divert because I know I want to talk more about privacy, yeah. but you're selling analytics. And, and I found that actually terrifies a lot of people in the sense that they say analytics and I, I can't use analytics. I, I you, you give me numbers, I have no clue what it means. Sure. And, and, and so do you try to avoid the word analytics? I'll tell you this, we, we, we actually, we have a term called UEBA, User Entity Behavioral Analytics. We realized that UEBA scared the crap out of people. And it was better for us just to behavior. We yeah. are behavior or so. And, and do, you, do you do the same thing? Do you find that, or maybe you haven't, but now you will, right? Do you find that, that you've got to, not intimidate people with your word choice and simplify 100%. what you're doing? 100%. Um, my partner is fond of saying that most of our customers can't even spell IoT. And, um, you know, um, I try not to say that in a contemptuous way because it's fine oh. they can't because they got other fish frying. And um, you're absolutely right. You know, nobody, I think, wants to have cognitive load particularly people who are busy and underpaid and, you know, overworked um, and, and who of us here isn't, um, you don't want a bunch of other stuff, right? Um, even if it's going to help you, if, you, if I've got to struggle over that mental hurdle to get to understand it well enough to accept it into my life, that it's just an impediment, right? So yeah, we absolutely um, try to try to tune these things down. So very rarely do I talk unless I'm talking to the IT guys, um, do I really talk about analytics? 
you know, we keep it easy because people know what reports are. Uh, people know what dashboards are, right? Dashboards and reports. People like reports. They don't know what to do with them, but they but they like them. So we start, you know, that's part of the journey is, you know, hey, we're not going to shove massive data sets at you because you don't know what to do with those. We're also not going to do a bunch of machine learning because that sounds scary too. You know, let's start easy. Let's start with yeah, some simple graphs. Hey, we'll turn that into some reports. We'll send some emails out with some insights. And as we go, get more sophisticated. And, and what's great is it leads people to ask more questions. I say, well, I'm glad you asked that question. That's a great question. What we do is we'd snap this and do that. Um, so it really does become um, an interactive educational process, right? But right. I think what's really important is not to make them learn things that they don't need to learn. Because mm -hmm. um, the, the really only thing they need to know is these kind of things can help you make better decisions and that makes your life better. Um, well, I'm, in, I'm intrigued from a, another use case possibility here and it has perfect. to have had crossed your mind is this one of, of both physical security and one of health uh, sure. alerts and concerns, right? So Absolutely. just like take the security piece, hey, I've got two people going into this room that probably shouldn't go in there and, you know, and they're still in there after 15, 20 minutes, that might not be good. Or I've had somebody go into the bathroom and you know, an hour doing. later they haven't come out, right? You know, <laughs> to Jeremy's concern earlier. <laughs> so, yeah, someone's in intestinal distress. Can you send somebody to help yeah. them? Yeah. We call so, that poop in real talk, time, Jeremy. <laughs> so talk about those uh, potential use cases, if you would. Yeah, you know, I think we begin to... Uh, of course, it's all possible, right? Um, being able to measure where people are, um, particularly if you're doing high resolution stuff like contact tracing, we're using Bluetooth tags. Um, you know, I can get within a six foot um, certainty of, of a contact with a location or, or two people um, and two people in a location if it's, you know, truly highly um, instrumented. Um, the impediment, I think, to that is not technological, it's cultural um, first, which is, most people don't want that. It's a little creepy. Um, so the value of that surveillance has to be so high that you can overcome that cultural barrier. And then I also got to trust you. So that's a big part of it. Do I trust that you're not doing the wrong stuff with this? I think that's a big part of that culture. And then there's a practical concern, which is how do I either detect those anomalies automatically in the magic world, <laughs> I think you mentioned, Chris, or how do I get the expert system to learn what I would say is alarming so it can detect an alert? That turns into a big problem in itself. What are the combinations of all the infinite combinations that you really care about? Um, and can you codify it in, in any meaningful way? Um, because I think the other downside of this is alarm fatigue. Um, you know, I worry about this a lot because we're generating alerts a lot, right? This, common cybersecurity problem too, right? Generate a lot of alerts, a lot of false alarms, or maybe some minor incidents. Well, I'm going to tune it out, right? You lose the real signal and the noise. The same is true if you're, you know, a building operator. Um, and I don't know if you guys have dealt with any physical security. You know, it's just real common for these guys to just walk in and just shut off alarms, you know, like, I, I, let me take care of that, you know, <laughs> shut that thing off. They don't even look anymore, right? It's just, it's just a noise. It's just part of their day. They just shut that alarm off. Um, this guy's smoking out back or it's a somewhere else, or is it a true intrusion? Well, you know, um, so I think that's the practical challenge in these other use cases. I mean, obviously if you've got a very highly controlled environment, you know, regulated space, um, secure data center or something like that. Probably the use case is well established. The rules are probably pretty clear and the value is high. Um, we've actually had a few people who do data center management come to us because that's a that's one of those weird kind of built spaces. Um, we haven't done anything in data centers yet, but you could see that um, I think as a natural extension. But um, you know, for your sort of workaday spaces, I think um, the world's got to mull over whether they want to spend the time uh, to overcome that cultural barrier and then you know, do the hard thinking that goes into setting those rules. It's actually hard enough to figure out if there's a, a cleaning event in a conference room on the sixth floor, who should get that email right? on a Tuesday at, at, at 4 p.m., right? Um, 
that's hard enough set of rules for these guys to struggle with because they've never had to think that way, um, you know, procedurally when you think about it, right? Um, sure. And um, so I think there's that 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 barrier to, um, and it is pure expert system thinking. How do you crack the head of the expert? What would you do in this situation? And then allow the computer to take that over. Um, you said a couple times, Tim, is you keep on bringing up expert systems, and I think it's a really good understanding because a lot of times people do think there's some magic out there. Is yeah. their fear of computers getting smart is because they're reading too much William Gibson and too, too you yeah. know. <laughs> and, and and the reality is is that um, the person writing the models, their intelligence and their understanding of the problem really dictates a good result, right? That yes. um, biasism of the, of the writer, and you hear it sometimes uh, in the wrong reasons, um, has a lot to do with their understanding of the problem set and the ability to articulate the understanding. So, so you're doing a lot of, um, you know, you say expert systems, but you're doing a lot of exact modeling, right? You're not just creating fuzzy yeah. models, right? Yeah. Well, I, I think maybe for our audience, let's, can you define what you consider expert systems to be, Tim? Yeah, um, I should. Uh, can I? Let's see. Um, yeah, so an expert system is really the idea that if you could come up with all of the logical rules about a domain, you could feed those rules into a computer system, and the system could evaluate the rules based on its awareness of the current state of the world, right, of the system or the, the things it could sense. That's what an expert system is. So it's it's taking the sort of mental model of an expert and then trying to reduce it to some codified um, structured rules, um, which in and of itself is a is a tricky bit, right? To codify that um, without being quite software, you know, it's not compiled code, but it isn't too far off. It's not, you know, uh, it's not natural language either. It's it's usually somewhere in the middle of those two things. And the yeah, expert system yeah. is really just following the human logic that you can write, you know, think of a just really complex if then else at the end of the day. Often I when I trot out expert system, people say, oh you mean if then else's I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> I mean a lot of <laughs> if then else. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, Jeremy, that's a good point. I mean one day we're gonna have to geek fest on the different types of, of systems out there when it comes to big data analytics and the right because you hear AI all the time, right? You hear it all. And, and, and I did hear somebody say the right one one day saying, so what version of neuro do you use? And, and, and by defining it that closely to AI, like you at least have to have TensorFlow as the first idiot level, that it does remove a lot of people from saying the wrong thing. Like, Tim, you're being honest. Like if you were trying to raise money, you'd be saying AI every time you open your mouth, right? That, that you have that level and then you know that's a that's a really good example is the you brought up the natural language processing style of the um of the conditional ifs and rules and the programming of, of the person's knowledge right and then there's also a feedback level at times right. in, the, in, the, in the expert um but it, it is kind of an interesting issue in our in our industry overall is the fact that the real value today is really expert systems with very good models not AI systems that are, you know, playing Jeopardy, right? Yeah. It's it, the, the, the really the expert system because the expert system is focused on answering the question that you paid it to do. While the AI is just going to give you 42. Yeah. Right. What I think is fascinating, you know, where, where I thought we might be when I got into this in the early 90s, I see we're on the precipice of this because I actually think there's a really powerful combination if you put expert systems together with machine learning and join them together in the in the river. Well, and, and we'll agree 100%. What we found out is, is that if you give too much raw data to an AI, it just gets understanding that there's a problem. Yeah. You have to give it a level of understanding and, and structure and knowledge. Otherwise, yeah. all it's going to do is aim to become structured. Yeah. Right? You, can't, you can't ask for a leap. You can't jump you know, over the barriers that a human has to get through. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think, Chris, you know, I think I used the phrase insight into action, which we say a lot around here. And part of it is not necessarily automation as the 
be all end all. Um, it's really human decision support, human action support, because there are so many places where a human in the mix, uh, empowered with the right information at the right time, is critical to really understanding. Because there's, you know, context is the word uh, uh, that, that's the crux of any real um, AI kind of conversation is what kind of context does the system have? And um, humans can fill in gaps of context and we don't even know that we're doing it. We just, it's just part of the plumbing. Um, and so not only do people like it better when you're really trying to support their own action, not, not remove them from the equation, I've seen that over the years, um, but it also really does benefit the system because the system doesn't have to be pinpoint precise. What it can do is be uh, directionally correct, guidingly correct. So one of the things I see us doing a lot is how do we boil down a lot of information into a much smaller subset, but then it's up to the human to look at it and act on it. So, Excellent. you know, I, and I think that is a combination then of expert system and machine learning and, and maybe, you know, more humdrum, um, you know, analytic tools, you know, just go back to the crystal report days, you know, a really well designed report for the real right reason that can, that can make a big difference. I know, right? <laughs> that would kill me. I'm sorry. Uh, All right. So I, I, now I'm going to talk for a minute or two since you guys have dominated the question and answers. Uh, I can hit the mute button. Uh, where's that mute? Yeah. Uh, where's that? <laughs> So uh, you have an IASME certification, which in reality, nobody outside of the UK has ever heard of, right? Are you going to pursue ISO 27001? Are you going to pursue SOC 2? How are us or your customers, how are your, your customers and their customers uh, assured that you're doing the right things to protect their data? Yeah, so, so get to the cyber brass tax here. Yeah, so, I mean, we're, we're still a startup. Um, maybe we're a little long in the tooth for a startup, but I can tell you my budget still says we're a startup. Um, and looking at ISO or SOC is a pretty steep, um, it's a steep hill uh, to climb. So what we have done uh, throughout is really looked at establishing the policies and procedures necessary, I think, to aspire to that level um, without having um, actually committed to going through the process. And so, you know, Cyber Essentials, ISME, uh, and now that Brexit has occurred, it used to be much more interesting in, in Europe. A lot of our customers are, are, are UK based or European based. Um, so that was, you know, a small barrier to kind of get our feet wet in terms of the certification, because it's a big commitment, you know, to, uh, to, to codify everything, to go through the audits, to, you know, uh, listen to the feedback and adapt it, you know, cause I, I, I'm not a big fan of processes that you just do the paperwork on and you don't tend to take seriously. So I really have been forestalling more serious uh, commitments because when we get there, I want to do it right. Um, and not just kind of do what I need to do to get the, get the signature on the paper. And at this point, most of our customers have been pretty understanding about that. Like they know it's a young industry. I think we're bringing some tools to uh, the market that uh, you can't buy from anybody else who's already got ISO 2701. So, um, but at the same time, I don't host a data center. Um, you know, all of our stuff is on tier one providers that do offer, you know, the nth level and I do have a dedicated uh, cyber team. So I do take it really seriously. Um, you've probably heard of the, um, the CAIQ cake. Um, so we, we've been on board with um, keeping really good open answers on the cake so that, um, you know, I wanna be really transparent because it's, I think part of the gestalt of the company is transparency of the data. I ought to be a transparent as a company. And, that's not always, you know, there are, I, I couldn't do business with my former banking customers yet um, because they would have requirements that, um, that many people don't. But, you know, I see it as, a, as an escalating uh, commitment. So I really think it's, it's, it's enumerated in terms of our revenue 
uh, more than anything else is when will we hit the revenue le level where I can afford to take um, you know, a SOC 2 or an ISO certification seriously. My guess is it's one of the next two years. Um, and um, what I want to try to do is keep us ratcheting up so that by the time we hit that, it's not a, you know, a massive disruption or, a, you know, a true shock. It'll be a, an incremental step for us. So was MicroShare the original company name or did, it was, was that a, uh, a rebrand? Yeah, it was a rebrand. So when did we uh, MicroShare it? About five years ago. Um, we originally started as Point.io um, and um, operated for a few years. And um, we um, were very focused early on on the API aspects of this. I said, you know, integration was really important to data aspects of this. Um, so we had really focused on sort of API enabling. Um, we were very oriented towards uh, document management and retrieval rather than sort of, you know, uh, IoT data. It was more, you know, Word documents and PowerPoint and, and stuff like that. And um, realized that at the time the industry didn't really care about any of that stuff. So, uh, you know, as we as we pivoted, one of the things that I built was this, um, a system so that people could build their own situational apps, you know, uh, think SharePoint, um, hopefully less dreadful, but you know, think, think what people do with SharePoint, um, build um, situational apps and that you could um, exchange um, pieces of your app and cobble them together, um, compose them. So we built early on this, this system. And what people were talking about, my customers, my prospects at the time, when I showed them all this stuff, they were like, yeah, yeah, files, you know, we got Dropbox, yeah, we got SharePoint. Anyway, how are you handling that sharing of all that stuff? Oh, well, you know, yeah, you can, you know, mark this for sharing and here's some rules, whether I can use your thing or that. Oh, that's really cool. You know, what are you doing about data? So, you know, and, the, and I told you, I'd tell you how stupid I was, you know, I was like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Here it is, uh, hit me up the head with, uh, with the two by four. Um, it's about the data, it's about the sharing. So that's when we kind of pivoted um, and said, look, it's really this data management is the core of this thing. People don't care about documents anymore. Maybe they should, but they don't. And, you know, this is where the, uh, this is where the gold lies. And then probably a year after that, we discovered IoT was the place. And, you know, that's, that, that's really how the journey went. So as an organization, have you taken professional investment? Um, I would call it semi-professional investment. So we've gotten to where we are without any venture capital. Um, we tend to go with family offices um, has been our source of funding. So we've raised uh, $21 million to date. So it's not a in, insignificant right. amount. It's, um, it's my, uh, my partner um, felt pretty strongly that we wanted to maintain control of the company and um, live through the pivots and um, respect our early investors. And probably we should have closed Point IO and started a new company. And um, you know, I think Silicon Valley wisdom would have that been the path, um, but we've uh, got pretty much the same cap table we had uh, on, uh, on that first week uh, evolved continuously. Um, do we think there's probably more um, uh, the, the Motley Fool is probably the um, the most significant uh, investor that we've had that uh, in terms of due diligence levels. Um, they have a venture fund. Um, the rest have been you know uh, family funds for the most part. What is your um, what is your exit strategy? Is this going to be a lifelong career, or is this a I'm looking for Waxy or Serve Pro or somebody like that in that space? In, in this kind of space to really take over and, and buy your company, buy your technology? Yeah, it's a good question. I think we're you know always asking that question as an entrepreneur, you just gotta always be looking out because eventually it gets harder to raise the money and grow the company. And sometimes brand counts for a lot. So this is not my first startup and I've sold uh, startups before. Um, we're not against the acquisition model. And I think what we'd be looking for is somebody who had access to the industry that could really drive out these more privacy oriented data management oriented implications of this. So rather than, you know, uh, find somebody who wants to clean toilets better, somebody who could really grasp the internal 
um, approach uh, an engine. That's, I think, what would excite me, frankly, as a, as a CTO, because greater exposure there, somebody bigger name, somebody who can afford and maybe already has these, you know, SOC 2 certifications, so I don't have to go through them myself. Um, that might create a synergy. We want to do that. I think our current thought is that we'll be looking at a small cap IPO um, as we stand today in the probably in the next uh, three years. Like doing something on uh, the pink sheets, uh, o OTC, or actually trying to go cr uh, crowdfunding? I think OTC, um, you know, we, um, we're fairly, um, like I said, we're fairly well penetrated in Europe. Uh, a lot of our funding has come from European sources, UK or mainland Europe. And, um, you know, a London stock exchange kind of um, offering probably would be um, a likely. Okay. Interesting. So the other thing is, as an entrepreneur, um, this is not your first rodeo. Uh, I think for all of us on the phone here, now it's none of our first rodeos in our companies, right? But do you have advice or or something that you can you can share with you know entrepreneurs listening to us today um, about your journey and and, and recommendations, uh, things you may have done differently? Hmm. I. I think entrepreneurship is um, a bit of a curse, um, which is something that I don't hear many people talking about um, in the tech space much. But you know, founding companies and going through early stage is a real roller coaster. Um, you know, emotional up and down. Um, you know, losing the shirt off my back. You know, I've been I've been bankrupt. Uh, you know, most most of your well-heeled tech guys don't know what it's really like to be truly broke. Um, you know, you have to cast back to your ramen noodle days, but even then, you had a you probably had a safety net. You know, it's it's different um, when you're you're betting your own money and you're not pulling a salary, and it, it can get pretty nitty gritty. And I think you have to do it because you love the process, and you can't imagine doing anything else. Um, because if you can't imagine anything else, you probably should do that other thing. I really think you should do that other thing um, because um, it's a hard way to make it in life. You know, obviously there's some unicorns and there's people who get radically lucky and hit it out of the ballpark in their 20s, right? But these are one in 10,000, one in 100,000 people end up, uh, the rest of us are grinding it out. We find ourselves in our 50s or 60s and we don't have any retirement fund. We're hoping we can just get this last one over the over the bounce so I don't have to eat cat food when I, you know, when I retire. So, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I don't do it to the choir. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, that's tough, but it's also, you're, you're living where the rubber meets the road. So you feel it, you know, you're not isolated from it. You really care and you got to know what people in the market are thinking. You got to know what your competitors are doing. You got to know what your family thinks you get, you know, <laughs> It's um, you don't, you can't live in this, uh, you know, um, yeah, it bubble, any more real. bubble. It's it real. It's any real, any super real. real. Yeah. I think that's right. You know, it's, I, uh, I probably overuse it, but I, I talk about, you know, the zombie apocalypse constantly because that's how I feel. You know, it's like, I'm finding any old thing on the road I can sharpen because I know the zombies are coming for me. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Economically, that's how I feel. Uh, entrepreneurship is, is kind of like that, right? It's improvise and um, you know, collect as many like-minded people as you can, arm them as best you can, and then and then figure out how to survive in, in some uncertain territory. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's a gamer's dream, I suppose. It is. So, so well, listen, you, we're, one, we're getting close. To, all right, one more. Come on now, I'm having fun. <laughs> you, you besides, you have another beer to open. Come on. <laughs> Well, I'm out of my beer. But You're by the way, the first one, this actually was pretty good. I might have to. I was going to say, Stone, it still tastes good six months <laughs> later. After <laughs> six months. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, you're, you're uh, so in that you say you got to find like-minded people. Is the team that you're working with now at MicroShare the same team you started with that point and that you worked with previously? You know, we've, um, 
We've got a lot of people who've been throughout the journey. My three founders, this is our uh, second startup together. Um, a lot of my, we're, we're now at about 40 people in the company. And I would say probably um, easily uh, 10, 15, you know, so uh, 25 or 30 percent of those people are, are people from from the past. Um, so it is one of those things where, you know, you build trust, mutual trust, you know, um, you get to know who's got your back and who can who can sharpen a piece of rebar into a serviceable weapon um, in a speeding amount of time. Right? Um, and, um, and, and have some fun, right? Because it is, um, it can be uh, depressive. So you better enjoy the manic times with people you enjoy being around. Um, and so you get, you take the, take a full advantage of the ups, have people with you. Um, because the downs, you're almost always alone on those. <laughs> well, other people are there, but but you never you never feel the downs together. That's yeah. that's not what they're like. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think uh, having a good team, people that are smart, um, diligent, um, that you trust, and can stick to it, you know, through the ups and downs. Because um, you know, if if at the end of the day, I don't know if we're going to be successful commercially. Um, you know, I I think we're I think we're out of the this goes to nothing zone. Um, maybe not comfortably, but I, I believe we're, we're, out, we're outside that space. But um, could I have made more money um, working for Fidelity? Probably. Staying with um, Accenture? Yeah, yeah, I could have stayed yeah. there. Um, I certainly would have a lot more airline miles than I do now, but um, <laughs> it's not the life I wanted to lead, you know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's funny, you, you said earlier in the conversation, building the airplane while it's flying. That's an Accenture commercial, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, right on. All right. Well, listen, we are getting to the top of the hour, Jeremy. And I think that um, for our audience sake, you know, we, we try to keep these fairly net at about 60 minutes. <laughs> so, so with that, uh, Two beers. any final thoughts, Chris, uh, for Tim? I, I think it was a wonderful conversation, Tim. I think, you know, you're a very real person on this uh, in the sense that uh, it seems like you actually enjoy the technology. I mean, it's, it was nice. It's nice to hear someone who actually uh, loves their product. And there's no doubt you don't love your product. And, and, and you should be proud of everything you've done. Um, Jeremy, what do you think, man? I'm just curious. How many patents have you applied for? Um, exactly one. Exactly um, one. Yeah, I... Um, is your, you know, is it's my job to look after the, I'm sorry. As, is the sensor tech somebody else's or is it? It's yeah, so we don't make any of the sensors. Our decision was not to be in the hardware game because the every other game is hard enough, let alone being on the hardware specific side of it. Um, one of the great things I think about today is there are so many toys laying around. You know, the big data wave created a huge amount of big data tools. The IoT wave that broke uh, created a huge amount of available hardware. And these tools are just sitting around. They're not purpose built. You got to do the work to glue them together. But there's so many cool things to to integrate. So we said, you know, we have to resist this constantly. There are some times we've strayed a little bit too close uh, to the hardware side. That's a tough. That's a tough world. You know, physical uh, manufacturing, and you know, that's it's it's not software. So, um, so we have tried to use off the shelf components, work with vendors, uh, manufacturers that we trust who put out good products and get involved with them to help them improve their products to kind of fit more of what we're doing. That's kind of been our strategy more than getting into uh, all of that. So really we're kind of an integrator um, from the purpose, from the perspective of our, of our uh, customers. It's really kind of pulling the best of the stuff off the shelf, gluing them together and make them solve their real problem. So, go ahead, Jeremy. No, no. I mean, I'll ask questions until you tell me to stop. So, all right. Well, it, it, <laughs> it, it is time to wind down. <laughs> so, with that, Tim, let me say that, you know, as, as a consumer, uh, I love the thoughts of what you're doing from the market. You're trying to help, you know, make places safer for us and cleaner, right? And, and stuff. And I think that that makes a big difference. Uh, being a rancher, you know, my own business owner here and then working in the cybersecurity firm, 
I understand the blood, sweat, and tears that comes into this. And, you know, God bless you guys for, for staying in that. And I, I want to wish you a lot of success in that area. So I think there's still a lot of good things that are to come from what it is that you're doing. Once people understand that value. So I think I, that's I, right. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, it's great having you on. Appreciate it, Tim. I told myself I wasn't going to cry tonight, guys. <laughs> <laughs>